Welcome to the Retirement Plan Playbook with Brent Pasqua, Matthew Thiel, and Joshua Winterswike from RPA Wealth Management. In this podcast, we cover current events, retirement planning strategies, and provide you with the tools to help you build a successful retirement playbook in any political or financial landscape. Join Brent, Matthew, and Joshua as they navigate the issues that can make the later stages of your retirement plan challenging and help you create the best retirement plan playbook. Now, let's get to the show. And we're back. Welcome to the Retirement Plan Playbook. I'm your host, Brent Pasqua, founder of RPA Wealth Management. I'm here with Matthew Thiel, certified financial planner. Also here with Joshua Winterswike, certified financial planner. Guys, the World Series is going. I haven't watched much of it personally, but are you watching it? I am now, but I'll let Josh give what his comment is first, and then I'll tell you why I'm watching it. I am not watching it. I actually didn't even know it was going on. So I didn't watch the first three games, but I watched a little, uh, the first four games, but I watched a little game five, you know, once my daughter was in bed. But I started watching it because um, one of the girls on our marketing team, Brittany, told me about something I never even heard of, which is the Phillies World Series indicator. And let me tell you guys, this isn't good. So going back... Any time a Philadelphia baseball team starting in 1929 has won the World Series as the Philadelphia A's in 1929, the market has crashed. Obviously, 1929 was the, the big crash. And then in two, 1980, there was a big market drop as when they won. And then in 2008, they won. And we all know what happened in 2008. So normally, I'd root against the Astros because they're big you know, cheaters, right? But now I'm switching. I am going full Astros. We don't want the Phillies to win. Um, hopefully, by the time this podcast is out, Astros have won the World Series. But, yeah, we do not want the Phillies to win. But the market has already crashed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, I think it gets worse. We, it, what if it gets worse? Matt, past results don't predict future returns. I, I'm just saying that this thing... Has three data points, and let's not make it a fourth. I got that saying completely wrong. I was being a little sarcastic, but not watching it at all. I kind of knew it was going on, but it was kind of a joke in here because it's just it doesn't have any sort of glitz or glamour to it. Phillies versus the Astros. You know, I think part of the problem is too is the playoffs. So many of the playoffs series happen during the day at like random times, eleven, twelve in the afternoon. So like the storylines of the playoffs never actually come together. They're just you end up with these two teams in the World Series. And most people haven't watched the playoffs because the playoffs are unwatchable because they're on when everyone's supposed to be working. Well, they have to start it in mid-afternoon because then the game will be done by bedtime. <laughs> if they start the game at, like, prime time, then it won't be done till the next morning. So then everyone will be like, ah, they'll just turn the game off. So that's why they start in mid-afternoon so it could take that full eight hours to get the game over. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, baseball's slow but they got they, <laughs> they got to figure something else out baseball there. is boring yep. okay so, so phillies equals market crash recession right. i'm still not rooting for the astros though oh, i'm just either. gonna say that history doesn't it's not gonna repeat itself here hopefully. yeah i don't like cheaters so i'm not voting for the astros all right let's get to hot take headlines uh the federal reserve raised interest rates they raised interest rates by 0.75 percent now that brings it to 3.75 percent or four this is the highest level since 2008, and during the press conference, Fed Chair Jerome Powell dismissed the idea that the Fed may pause raising rates soon. Should we really start to question what the Feds are actually doing here, and is it concerning that they're raising rates again? Yeah, I mean, they're pretty much trying to cause a recession at this point, and he... The press conference was really interesting because one thing Powell said was that that the soft landing that they're kind of going for is, you know, pretty much off the table now. He's trying to cause a full on, you know, recession, which I think is really weird for people to hear and to understand. But, you know, it, for a long term picture, the stock market's not going to bottom until the Fed stops raising rates or it's not going to resume. Or at least slows down. Yeah, it's not going to resume its uptrend. So I think that's the most important takeaway for people as the Fed keeps raising rates the market's going to go sideways to down. Right. So as, as if they're planned to keep raising them, 
the rebound that we keep talking about or the recovery we're talking about is not going to begin until the feds decide to stop raising rates. Correct. Yeah. Think of it more like in a broad sense, like there'll always be rebounds, right? Like we had a rebound for October. We're probably going to get a rebound into November, December, but it's not going to be a new sustained bull market until the rate rises stop. So everyone's waiting for this fed pivot. And the agenda is the same. That's what he said, right? They're sticking to their stance. And I think that you said, you know, are we starting to question? I think the questionings already happened, right? Probably since late summer of how many of these rate increases, when are they going to pivot, like Matt said? So until something changes, you know, why is the market going to completely recover? Yeah, and I keep, I think we. it's just prolonging what we're all waiting for and we're all wanting the market to recover. And every time they do this, they come out with this announcement and then the market just crashes right back down and it's wiping away all the gains that we were just seeing from the last couple of weeks. Yeah. I, you know, like we said, we said on a million shows this year, we haven't done a million shows. We said on a lot of our shows this year. You know, the big takeaway is this is such a win for boomers. Higher interest rates, right? At the time when you need fixed home run for, you know, retiring baby boomers. But does he actually know what he's doing? That's the question I have. <laughs> well, it's just, I think that like they're sticking to their stance and they don't have a lot of tools to battle this type of inflation. I mean, this is what their only tool for the most part. And so it looks, he's very prideful that he can't change his stance or at least kind of slow this down. And we know we've saw some of the data, right, Matt? I mean, inflation in certain areas has kind of topped and it's not broad spectrum all over anymore. So I just, the questioning of Powell is definitely warranted. The job market. They, he, he needs the job market to get crushed. That's what makes them nervous. They, they don't like wage growth. Like, you know, I think back to two, three years ago when so many people were campaigning on, you know, raising the minimum wage. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's pay McDonald's workers 20 bucks an hour. No, it's a poor idea because it causes inflation. We talked about that on this podcast when that originally happened. And I guess that for the understander, the listeners to understand, too, wage growth is not helping inflation, like you just said. Yeah, so that's why they're worse. wanting to battle that. All right, let's get into the second headline. There's a big tech earnings wreck. Alphabet, which is Google, Amazon, Meta, Microsoft, lost a combined $350 billion in market cap the final week of October. Long-term earnings forecast at Meta and Amazon were gloomy, and all of these companies are suffering from slow growth. These slam dunk stocks were there for pure growth for so long. Is that over now and what's happening? Yeah, I think it's over. You know, we had the big fan companies for a long time. At first it was Netflix this year. They've since recovered, but you know, it's probably not going back to where it was. Now you're looking at the same meta has essentially been shot. It's down 73% this year. And then now it, it's pulling over into Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, and, you know, Apple's probably next. But this year, Google is down 41%, Amazon's down 46 and Microsoft's down 35 I mean, that's a bloodbath on these big companies. The good news is that there's a real positive takeaway that I think clients should know and listeners of the show should know, is that with these companies crashing in the recent weeks, it didn't crash the stock market. Because there's other stocks now going up, right? And that's what we're trying to do in our portfolios. That's why we've always leaned more value and kind of stayed away from these big tech companies that were more growth. So the value stocks are doing really well and it's helping to lift up portfolios. I th I, I guess my, my next question too is if you look at market capitalization, we looked at this in the past, you know, you had like your six major companies out there like these that made up probably I think 52, 53% of the whole U.S. market capitalization. And with this decrease that now we've seen in these companies, but then the increase in other companies, is that really getting squeezed? Are they getting smaller based on market capitalization in the U.S.? Yes, they are. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it is a little bit of a reset because we could probably look back and make the argument that they were overvalued for a long time, right? Just add on an earnings multiplier point of view. And just take Amazon for an example. I mean, this isn't the first time like they've ran at a net operating loss, but the market now and the where it's at is finally pricing in their kind of 
poor performance and their losses. And we're seeing investors react to it. And, you know, they're just not taking the name of Amazon anymore and still, you know, buying. They're actually selling now because things are changing. You know, you could see Google and Amazon and Microsoft. They obviously and Apple. They they have a tremendous place in the market space. But Meta is like, to me, this one that's kind of on an island because they're making a lot of adjustments to their business plan where I don't know they actually know where they're they're going. The best thing that could happen to Meta is TikTok being banned in the U.S. If TikTok gets banned in the U.S., that stock's going to be up 20 or 25% the next day. They've invested so much money in the whole Reels software. Yeah, A lot of their money's going there. And Meta, Facebook, for everyone that doesn't remember um, how this changed. But long-term for these companies, they need to transition from, you know, we're talking about being growth stocks. Um, which is a category of stocks that you can invest in to more value stocks. You can start paying dividends, buying back shares. Uh, honestly, they probably need to lay off 10% of their workforce and stop hiring so much and giving away stock options like it's free money. They just have to transition to be more like Procter & Gamble, more like ExxonMobil, you know, kind of these boring companies that we think of as traditional value stocks. When do they, when do companies usually transfer from growth to value or do some people never, some companies never make that transition? It's an interesting question. I think some companies never do it. Apple did it, right? Apple was a growth stock from 2002 to 2012. The market crushed it. It was down like 40, 50%. And then it came in and transitioned. They started paying a dividend, buying back shares, and it turned into a more of a value stock. What a great stock. That's the cleanest shirt in that dirty laundry, right? Out of the companies we talked about, Apple. Absolutely. But in my opinion, it could be the next shoe to drop. So hopefully not. All right, let's get into the next headline. Elon, who we've talked about a lot on the show, closed the Twitter deal. Following up on a previous story that we had talked about, I don't know how many times we've gone over it, but Elon Musk has taken out ownership of Twitter. He closed the $44 billion acquisition of it. And Musk immediately fired top executives, which include the CEO, the CFO, and the policy chief. This has been a controversial acquisition over the last, I don't know, eight to nine months. What do you think actually happens to Twitter from here? I have honestly no clue on this one. Hopefully it becomes a, a better social network. You know, there's a, a lot of rumors it changes. I, I think the biggest one is they're going to start charging users for those blue check marks, which is good. And it sounds like they're going to add like a premium option for you to pay. The other interesting thing is, I forgot what the, the software was called. Do you remember Vine, Josh? Yeah. The social thing? The like short video. Yeah. Yeah, so... Twitter is just so stupid. Mark Zuckerberg famously said that Twitter like drove a clown car into a gold mine. So Twitter had the technology for TikTok before TikTok was around. It was called Vine. Yeah, Vine was pretty popular too. Yeah, and they closed it down for some reason. Mm. And then TikTok just copied it and made a better algorithm and then, you know, started owning social media. And then short form video blew up and now it's on every single yeah, so platform. It's just been such a mismanaged company. I can't imagine Elon's going to do worse for it. Because aren't they talking also about including like being able to exchange money like a PayPal on Twitter? Isn't that part of the plan going forward too or, or a potential for the platform? Yes. And also like uh, WhatsApp, which is like a communication service. So texting and phone calls, video chatting. I don't know if that's going to work, in my opinion, with Twitter platform. But, I mean, I think that he will make it a better company. We know Twitter as a, kind of a, a cool platform that we all use, but not a very good company at making a lot of money. Um, and I think that he will transform that. But he's kind of making, he made this statement in his open letter, too, that he's not going to completely reform Twitter, just make it hopefully better. I think it's funny that a lot of advertisers, big big Fortune 500 companies, have been pulling their ad spend on Twitter for for no reason whatsoever, other than Elon took over. But I, I wonder how many of those top executives who are managing those marketing budgets and pulling ad spend are driving Teslas today. So I'd imagine a lot of them. They'll be back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they will. I, I guess regarding the blue checks, does that mean like we can get blue checks as long as we pay for it? Yes. So that means that. As long as I'm verified for who I say I am, like my Twitter matches actually who I am, I can be verified. I'm considered verified. And then, you know, I could actually have one of those little blue checks next to my name. Yes. I have a question for both of you. Are you going to pay $8? 
Yes. Yeah, why not? I like the product. And it sounds like um, they're going to add more features. Like it kind of might be a Prime membership style deal where it just gets better and better. My problem with Twitter is like a lot of social media is, is you can act as someone that you're not. You don't have to identify who yourself, meaning that you could say anything you want and nobody actually know who's that's coming from. I think personally that anybody operating on Twitter should be verified as who they are. You shouldn't be able to say things unless you're standing behind what you're saying. You shouldn't be able to create burner accounts and, and nope. talk about you in a good light when everyone else is talking bad about you? No. Okay. That, <laughs> so that's the whole thing. Like a lot of the current blue checks who also are usually seem like they lean very blue and political preferences are up in arms because they're losing their status symbol. Yeah, of course, because then they're no longer going to have this sort of verification that they stand out versus everybody else. Yeah, everyone else could get the same badge. Yeah, but there is some validity to people being able to stand out of, like you want to know from your headlines who's t- talking. Like if there's a reporter, you want to be able to to verify that that reporter stands out from somebody else just talking. Yeah, like the, the information's valid or the opinion's valid or from a like a trusted source. Yes, yeah, except reporters aren't trusted sources. <laughs> yeah, not anymore. But you could use That's any example. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. I was thinking more about like football reporters, not like news reporters. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Great tool for Adam fantasy Schefter. football. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get in the next one. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the tech layoffs that are happening. Uh, Amazon has paused corporate hiring. Lyft has actually announced it's cutting 13% of its employees. Stripe announced it's cutting 14% of its employees. Open Door uh, has let everyone know that they're cutting 18% of the employees. And Twitter is actually expected to potentially lay off 50% or up to 50% of its employees. Is this a sign of what's to happen next year? Yeah, I think this is just the beginning. Um, this is sad, right? Because you see you're putting it in percentages, but it's really people, right? People are losing their job. They're losing their source of income. Now it's, are they going to be able to pay their mortgage? Are they going to be able to pay for their car? We don't know. And it's very sad when people lose their job. It happens, you know, frequently, but it's, it's not something you want to deal with, but this is what the fed wants. This is what they're, they're forcing. This is their stated mission is they want people to lose jobs, um, which I find weird because from like that 2008 period to kind of like, 2013, 14, 15, there wasn't enough job growth. Remember the Fed kept being like, we need more job growth. We're keeping interest rates low for a long period of time, more jobs, more jobs. And now they're like too many jobs, too high wages. Let's, we need people like unemployed basically. One extreme to the other. Yeah, exactly. It's that pendulum that keeps swinging. Absolutely. But it just seems weird that you want, I know that there's the economic side of it, but you don't want people to have jobs. Yeah, I mean, it's just the byproduct also of slowing down the economy if you're taking a more macro look at it. You know, slowing down the economy means that we have to have job loss, wage growth needs to slow down, job cuts, you know, all of those things that come with it. It is, like like Matt said, said it is sad because there's people going to be losing their jobs, but we've gone through periods like this where there are layoffs. And, you know, as the economy recovers, hopefully quickly, those jobs are going to be needed again. Why don't they just try to slow wage growth and like, you know, they raised minimum wage to an unattainable amount in California. Like, why don't they just slow the growth, growth wage and having to lay off all these people? They want to be in control. <laughs> yeah. they, they want to power the ship down. It's more it's more difficult to to do that. I don't think they have basically the Federal Reserve's really only controls to, to raise interest rate and expand the money supply. So raising rates, they're trying to cause people to lose their jobs. Really what would be nice if we had a functioning government. So we had a functional government, you could work together with the Federal Reserve to get things done. But, you know, everybody's so worried about looking smart on Twitter or, or CNN or MSNBC. And they're so worried about getting reelected um, that the government doesn't want to put any good policies in to help the current mess we're in. It just always seems like we're being reactive versus proactive. Yeah, the one extreme to the other. Absolutely. Uh, let's get into the last headline. Uh, Southern California shipping container is no longer backed up uh, ship waiting to unload at the ports fell from 109 to four. The biggest reason for the decline is U S import volumes are declining. And are we actually just finally getting caught up or is this a byproduct of the volume being down? 
Yeah, so when I first heard the story, I thought to myself, oh, wow, this is really positive. They cleared the backlog and there's stuff coming through the ports and things are moving. But then the further down the article I read, is, you know, it's speculated basically that it's because no ships are coming. So that's probably not a good sign for next year. And if companies aren't ordering, they're definitely expecting a recession. Like we just talked about, there's probably more layoffs coming. Uh, it's another indicator of a slowdown, right? Yeah. We're, we're, most of these headlines are really good indicators of the economy slowing down. And I think this is also, you know, the over ordering. Everyone was so afraid in COVID. We're seeing like inventory supplies all over, even just in Southern California. There's a stockpile, right? Like these companies have massive amounts of inventory they're going to have to try to get rid of. Naturally, they're going to slow down the ordering and those ships are going to stop coming in. I've been monitoring my email because, you know, we're getting close to Black Friday, Christmas season, holiday season shopping. And it seems like most brands, while not doing it consistently, are somewhere between 20 to 25% off heading into most weekends now. Um, so You're talking about Im- discounts, discounts and sales. Yeah, so I would imagine that's kind of the low bar as we head into you know the holiday season. Like We're probably going to see some pretty big sales. I'm looking for 40 to 50%. I still need some patio furniture. I mean, that, that was 2008. In 2008, you could walk into almost any store and get items 50, 60% off. It was crazy. Yeah, I feel like things are still, though, really expensive. They are, yeah. So I saw an interesting headline that Walmart is rolling back Thanksgiving food prices to 2021. But I just remember back to 2021 <laughs> and people complaining about food prices in 2021. <laughs> yeah, so. that's what I thought. Like, well, <laughs> They're yeah. rolling it back to expensive times. <laughs> Great. I mean, maybe go back to 2019, Walmart. So when does, like, you know, the, the cost of these things, whether it's vacations, trips, hotels, goods, that things that you want to buy, when is that really, when are we going to see those decreases? Demand slows down. It's all these trickle down, all of these headlines, all these variables we've been talking about is going to slow demand and inventory and services are going to be at a surplus and you're going to see prices decrease and that's when you're going to get your sales and everything else. Yeah, but let's wrap this all back to the stock market, right? So the market's been poor this year. The Fed's raising rates. The market has anticipated all those Fed rates and continues to anticipate them as the Fed gets, quote unquote, tighter or, you know, more stringent with monetary policy. The Fed stated its goal is to cause a recession. The stock market knows that. It's pricing that in. That's why it's going down now. So by the time we get to this recession that we could all clearly see that's uh, on the horizon, the stock market's going to start going up again. Uh, so that's why it's very, very important as an investor you know, to always stay the course, stay longer stocks, keep them in your portfolio because you're not going to be able to anticipate the bottom. Um, the stock market is far ahead of the actual economy right now. And I think that that's just a really important point that you had just mentioned. And for the listener to understand that recession doesn't mean potentially more stock market pain. So that's just kind of my summary. Yeah, I think we're all ready for this bounce. It's just nobody knows when it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get into the retirement planning corner. The midterm election has come and gone, and regardless of the results, you know, I think it's a, a big heated th- debate. You know, a lot of people want to believe that if a certain political party wins versus the other, that's going to mean better market returns. And I think that's what we're here to try to navigate through is what is the actual results of the midterm election mean historically to the stock market nothing anytime there's a political event it's usually you know a massive nothing burger you know maybe if we if we had a president a person who got elected especially on the presidential side who's going to move the u.s from being you know capitalist to communist i mean you know maybe it'd be a different story but for the most part it's it's a Nothing burger. In my opinion, too, and, and I know, Matt, you're going to give some data pieces about kind of returns through midterm election years as well. But, you know, whenever we have elections, there's a lot of uncertainty going into the election. But as soon as it's done, the uncertainty is gone. Like we can now plan forward for the next two years or the next four years because we now know who's controlled in our government. Again, I think that the lack of uncertainty once the election's over is a positive thing. So just getting through next Tuesday will be good. Yeah. You know, it, it, since 1926, it really hasn't mattered what parties controlled the House and the Senate. Stocks have gone higher regardless. The biggest drivers of stock returns are actually interest rate changes, which we're seeing right now. Geopolitical events, which we're also seeing right now. 
and then technological advances, which is what we just had over the last, you know, call it 10 to 30 years, depending on how you, how you want to look at it, right? With the computers and the internet and then the smartphone. Um, and then since 1926, following the midterm election, right? So the midterms are always in November. Um, the average return in November for stocks is 2.7%. And the average return in December is 1.5%. So on average, stocks have been higher following the midterm. And then this is what really gets me excited for next year. I know we've painted a nasty picture. Remember, it's possible to have a recession with a stock market rally. But during non-election years, which would be next year, 2023, on average, stocks have returned 14% since 1926. Let me phrase it a different way. Non-election years, which is going to be next year, on average, stocks have, have returned 14.6%. Average return of stock prices historically since 1926 is around 9%. So the data seems to suggest we're in for a pretty big year next year. Right, which also means we're coming out of a really bad year, which you might include or added recovery to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's possible, too, that stocks start out poor next year. That's well within the realm. I mean, and then they could rally 30, 40, 50% from the lows. You've, you've had hit two variables, right? Midterm elections, after the midterm elections, great rates of return. Non-election years, great rates of return. We also seen the data behind when inflation peaks, there's great stock market returns after that. So we have a lot of variables to look forward to, um, even though this year has been so poor. Although I think a lot of people will want to think that the midterm has this great impact on the market. You know, the market already has established a mind of its own and it already knows where it's probably going. I think, like you said, it just wants to know the outcome, but it doesn't really care what the outcome is. And hopefully now that just means that we can move on to, into next year and sort of get this kind of rebound that we've all been waiting for. Yeah, move past it, move on. Yeah. All right, let's get into the RPA recommends. Uh, Matthew, what do you have for us? I've been a, I don't know if I've done this. I know, Brent, you've done this, but I just want to second your um, recommendation for the Sonos speaker systems. Those are really great. I've been I've been liking them on a lot. I have a sound bar. Um, I'm hoping to pick up a few more pieces on Black Fridays. You, you had a sound bar before, right? Yeah, it was awful. Okay, so the Sonos sound bar is by far better than your old sound bar. Yeah, and I don't even have the sub because I was cheap. Did you get the Sonos ones yet, the little speakers that I keep telling you to get? No, I'm waiting for those to go on sale. Got it. I'm going to buy all my Sonos stuff when it goes on sale. It's um, starting to go on sale. Yeah. So great, great, great product. Highly recommend it. Um, I wouldn't mess around with another soundbar for your TV. It's just very easy to use. You know, don't buy a Samsung soundbar to go with your Samsung TV. Just go buy the Sonos. Don't listen to the salesperson at Best Buy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Sonos works great. So I'm going to go back to the well on my recommends because I know how much you love the app, Honey. It's a discount app that you can add to your internet browser and it finds discount codes for you. So when you go buy those new Sonos, make sure you run the Honey app and it's going to find you an even better deal. Well, and, maybe, and maybe. we're coming up on Black Friday deals. We're coming up on shopping for the holidays. Go download that Honey app. Give it a try. Matt loves it. Maybe now that the economy is slowing a little bit, honey will prove useful. But during a bull market, honey was like trying to shoot fish in a barrel. Like just none of the codes worked. It was a waste of time. Brent, did the codes work on honey for you? Yes, but I will say this. Just because honey says there are no coupons, that doesn't mean there are no coupons. Go and just Google the coupons for it. And there's a lot of times you'll find them. I agree. I agree with that too. It's not a, your only option to finding a, a code, but it makes it easier. Yes. And I think one thing that, to piggyback on that, that's important is like you and I were talking about the other day, how maybe like a third of your basket is just stuff that you're recurrently buying at when you go to the grocery store and that you can buy those, a lot of those products online and getting them delivered, but you can use discount codes when you buy them. So you're buying them for 25% cheaper than what you're paying for them in the store. So you're already getting a significant discount. Yeah. And to give an example of what you're, you're talking about too, is like if you have a specific 
brand of like chips that you like or a specific food brand, a lot of them like direct sell to like the consumer and you can go to their website and find discount codes and stock up and get it even cheaper. So that's a good tip too. Yeah. I know we were talking about that, but that is smart. Yeah. I mean, I do like all my meats I order from cook's venture and that comes direct and they have discount codes and it gets shipped directly and I'm not paying you know grocery store f- prices for it and I get better quality from food. And it comes right to your door. You don't even have to go to the grocery store. Yeah. I think Siete, we were talking about the Siete brand is another one. That yep. And they have that. chips and beans and all of that's healthy, organic, no chemicals. I, I, I eat that way too. But I just want to tell you guys that as someone who's probably listening to this podcast, they're probably like, oh, these guys sound super bougie right now. No, yeah. it's, it's a way to save money. I think, I think that's what's important. Yeah, I think most people are buying Tyson and uh, <laughs> Pepsi Frito Lay products. Well, I'll tell you, it's not that much more expensive to eat really clean food. It's not, and it's worth it for your health over the. But long for run. anyone that does, you know, likes yeah. a little like more premium brand of a grocery or product, it's there's there's ways to save money. Yeah, and, and you know, you're helping yourself for the long run, right? You're staying healthy, yep. staying healthier. That's the benefit. Speaking of staying healthy, my RPA recommends is one that. I talked about a lot in the beginning shows, and for those that didn't listen to, you know, probably episodes one through 15 before COVID, my recommend is Orange Theory. And I've been back for like the last (laughs) six, eight weeks. I've been back at Orange Theory working out. I can hear the excitement in your voice. I love it. Now, I've been using the Peloton treadmill for the last two plus years as COVID was ramped up and the gyms were closed and got used to a morning routine, which I'm still doing. But I integrated in Orange Theory, and I'll tell you, it's the best value for your hour, not only financially based on cost, but the workout that you get. If anybody's looking for a workout regime, because I know like the old gym memberships, a lot of people have tried, and those are tried and failed. Like You got to commit yourself to going. But when you want to commit an hour that you don't have to think about your workout and you're going to be very, very productive and get your good workout in. To me, it's the only style of workout. It's extremely effective for me. They're all over, right? It's they a are. franchise. Yes. So like, it's not just specific to an area. Yep. You have them. So you can search and find one close to your area. Yeah. Yeah. When I saw your hot take headline, I thought it was interesting. So I wanted to relate it to stocks. I just want to look to see how all the actual gyms and stuff are trading. Still not pretty this year. So maybe you're, maybe you're a little bit ahead of it, but we know Peloton's actually gotten crushed this year. Yeah, it's been a bad year for them. But Planet Fitness, which is the largest one, is down 30% this year. They're the largest? Yeah. Really? I think they're the largest publicly traded, yeah. Gym business is a bad business. Yeah. Yes. Very bad business model. But anyways, all right, sorry. Let's close the show. So, yeah, so if you're looking for a good workout, check out Orange Theory. So as advisors, we love helping people. That's why we do it. If you'd like to schedule an appointment with any of us, please go to rpawealth.com and schedule a complimentary consultation. You can also download our ebook from our website. And if you'd like the show notes, please go to retirementplanplaybook.com. But as always, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Plan Playbook. Click the following button to be notified when new episodes become available. To get in touch with our team, call us at 909-296-7977 or visit our website at www.rpawealth.com to schedule a complimentary consultation. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of RPA Wealth Management. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.